Uh oh. Sean, you still got a glitch. Or is this the Matrix? Was there a cat this. in the picture? I think I had some deja vu. I was thinking about this last night. I think if they ever wanted to reboot the Matrix, I think they should just get away from the Neo angle and find, because there's got to be more than one person that can see the Matrix, and find a new person, find a new group to beat up on the Matrix. I think that would be a fun re, uh, reboot of the sh the movie th franchise. You mean like the cast of Office Hours? Are you Neo? Are you getting a red pill and a blue pill? It's Mr. Anderson to you. Oh. I suspect Hosma Gujar is running the whole show. That explains it. Get a little bit of uh, background noise, uh, Jeffrey. Because I have a fan on right now. Copy that. Chilling. I guess my audio is a little bit roomy, but uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, it's actually sounding pretty good. So I would be accurate if announcing the senior coverage. It is 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So two hours after our show by my calculations. What's the best way to tune in to Cinegear? Well, I believe um, all of the same channels. So we have uh, YouTube, as well as our Mukana, as well as our esteemed, if you're part of the esteemed higher echelon group, then you're in the quiet theater in After Hours. That's right. Shout out to all my homies. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can find out more about what we're doing at officehours.global. Um, the show is a question and answer show, and you can be the producer by submitting the answers that we cover today. You can also vote on those questions. So we encourage all of our producers to use Mukana and vote up and down the questions to be able to drive our show today. 
We have, uh, we're especially looking forward to after our program, we have office hours special coverage of Cinegear. So tune in a couple hours after our show, but let's get right into our program. Dave, what do we have? We have Craig McFarland starting us off from Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. One of the simplest techniques to use and teach in virtual meetings to reduce people from stepping on each other. Dr. Clark. Well, there's no substitute for practice, but uh, rather than getting into a direct answer to your question, I want to refer you, Craig, to uh, an old document that's available online called Circuit Discipline, published by the U.S. Navy to uh, educate us sailors or former sailors in how to use uh, what's called a sound powered phone system on shipboard. And it's a very similar system to Zoom in a way in that um, you need to depress a button in order to speak into the system, but everybody's on the system audio all the time. So as you can imagine, there are lots of opportunities for interrupting and talking over one another. And the circuit discipline doc document is wonderful, timeless guidance on how to make that system work effectively. I put the uh, citation to it in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I wanted to make sure that you were finished before we went to Jeffrey. Oh, that's Go ahead, Jeffrey. Okay. See, uh, so basically, it, it, the, the toughest part about Zoom is that everybody's coming in at slightly different latencies. So even though I, I'm talking right now, you might not be seeing me until so many milliseconds later. And if, uh, you know, uh, Ronnie might be hearing me like 250 milliseconds later. Uh, I know that there's some Zooms that I go on that some people are in countries where and on machines and internets where it's like a two second latency uh, back and forth. So uh, the best thing to do is to always uh, make sure that you create a statement or sentence or question and then bring it to its complete conclusion and make it feel like it's actually going to be at that conclusion and nothing else is going to happen from there. And by the way, don't uh, don't say by the way I am because that's going to also cause a little bit of train wreck. Object lesson finished. All right, yes. let's go to Dave. Well, uh, when mentioning circuit discipline from the Navy, it reminded me that there's a th thing they teach called classroom discipline that all teachers go through, and they learn various techniques of handling. Uh, a classroom that's very excited or students who aren't responding. And the whole notion of putting your hand up in class has translated to Zoom. You can put your hand up in Zoom. So students often pick that up rather quickly. And the advantage in Zoom is that it's usually answered in order so that they get the feeling that they'll be heard at some point. Because sometimes if five people put their hand up and the teacher only comes to one, uh, a person could be left out. But in Zoom, it, it works a little better. The adjustments I've been hearing from teachers is that that hand up thing is something students adopt rather quickly. And lesson management and discipline in the classroom is something teachers deal with all the time. Uh, distractions are there and keeping students focused on the tasks and then wandering amongst the students to make sure they're on task is all part of the teacher's skill set. So translating that to Zoom or, or other virtual meetings is pretty easy. It's when you get undisciplined uh, managers and people who argue uh, that that becomes a problem. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and I've gotten to the point where I just help people understand that that's an expectation and it's okay and apologize if you interrupt and make sure you call out the next person afterwards. So if I were to interrupt someone, I'd finish my train of thought and say, and I think so-and-so was going to share next. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, those are all ways in which you can um, socialize the change, um, control the wetware. There are sometimes possibilities, depending on the platform, to actually control the latency, to lower it. Sometimes a, um, a trade-off of redundancy can happen. Uh, for example, if you, um, if you do look at um, the latency time, so in Zoom, uh, for example, um, you can see what your latency times are to a server. 
um, and your internet connection uh, fidelity or physics may determine just what those um, uh, unsymmetrical latencies that uh, Jeffrey was speaking about are. But some platforms uh, allow you to trade some redundancy, some resilience for faster uh, back and forth times. Um, another option that's been used sometimes in broadcast is to use a low, uh, low latency um, backhaul communication, uh, something that has lower like cellular, for example, to be able to talk. Um, it is a bit extreme if you're just in your casual Zoom meeting, but it is one of the techniques that's been used in the past. Let's go to our next question. Our next question is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. He's asking about live mode. According to an Office Hours live interview at Cinegear, it supports Zoom. How does it do this? And what is a clear, detailed explanation of live mode? Go ahead, John. Paul sent me a text message and wanted to make it clear that this is the flow um, unit and not the, uh, not the uh, link. So he wanted that clarification. Thank you, John. I'm not entirely sure what live mode is. I did not see that portion of the coverage yesterday, so I guess I can't help you with that there today, Paul. Jeffrey, can you help us out? I believe the live mode is some software that you can install in there. Uh, the flow is a three access gimbal, so I'm not exactly sure how that could actually connect up to Zoom. Your phone would be the one thing that connects up to Zoom. So what it's probably they're probably saying is that you can use the flow uh, uh, hooked up to your uh, to your camera, maybe even just kind of set it like this in front of you with the flow stabilizing. So if you've got a you know on a ship or something like that, you're not shaking all over the place. Uh, the link I, I did see a couple of videos for the link, by the way. Uh, so I believe that's extra software that comes in and uh, then it connects up to Zoom. That's a USB camera. So even if you don't put on any extra software, you still connect connect up to Zoom and use it just like you would there. But uh, with the software, you can turn on and off the uh, the functionality, like the hand gesture and things like that. Uh, and, and I'm guessing with the flow that that'll be the same thing. There's probably going to be some software on the on the phone that'll allow it to turn on and off the flow uh, movement, the AI uh, functionality from there. Ronnie, well, in my experience, uh, having several apps doing the same thing in in the back of Zoom is not uh, necessarily a good solution. We have had numerous problems. Uh, running uh, apps uh, simultaneously. So I'm, I'm also wondering how this is uh, going to be uh, working out. Well, we'll have to look into it and get back to you, Paul. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Craig McFarland in Boston, Massachusetts, asking, I couldn't find a Stream Deck Plus plugin for dial control of mic and input levels. So I'm building one. Is this of interest to others? Dave? It is of interest to me. I've been looking at Stream Decks for a while now because I see everybody using them and how their functionality can improve things. And I, I was very curious about the stream, stream Deck Plus because, of course, it has the three knobs, if I understand correctly. And assigning those three knobs in different applications is so, somewhat preset. But it's uh, interesting that he's having to build a dial control for his mic and input levels. And I'd be curious how you're building that and whether it's something you'll offer up to the rest of the people in office hours. Yeah, and while you're at it, Craig, I wonder what platforms you're supporting, interfaces, and um, you know, certain details. But um, yeah, curious, curious. Maybe we can, we can weigh in. If it's not a stretch, uh, support us all. Let's go to our next question. From Paul Wallhouse uh, in Austin, Texas, co-pilots. Microsoft has them everywhere, including GitHub, even Terminal. How does this affect software development? Start off with John Preto. So go back and watch the Microsoft Build event, which was about 10 days ago now. All those videos are available on the net. They go through all the different co-pilots. But we're seeing our programmers are, are saying using co-pilot, they're about 20% more effective than they are without co-pilot. So it's a huge jump forward in productivity. John Snyder. 
Yeah, and Microsoft's making the round. So uh, many, many different podcasts have interviews with their senior leaders about their future uh, of the computing world. And it looks like everyone's trying to position generative AI, especially as the next big platform. ChatGPT is <clears throat> starting to incorporate plugins to interact with different resources. Microsoft's trying to build co-pilots for, and, and Microsoft's vision is to have separate, especially tuned co-pilots for different tools. So um, the thing that's telling you how to write an email has a different knowledge base than the thing that's telling you how to make a good PowerPoint presentation. And that's Microsoft's vision for the future. And I think it's likely that uh, AI is here to stay. Well, you might be a little biased there since our presentation in our second half is on AI, but let's see what Harshid has to say. Yeah, so I think it's all about efficiency, right? So we have these tools and we are in the past we were using maybe assistants such as the Cortana platform or whatnot. So if we look at the idea of what these applications give us, even if it's on terminal or other with Copilot in the specific, uh, it gives us a better efficiency level and speed and productivity because nowadays uh, a program or a worker is always pressured to have deadlines met quickly. So if a company has a knowledge base or uses Copilot efficiently, even for the product that they're making internally, they could have advantage over the other to get speed over a product release cycle or a bug fix. So I think this is definitely a big help in the environment that we live in, in AI. So even though it's different variations of terminal or uh, a product with M365 or anything else, I think that we're, this is going to be a quick, uh, a better efficient uh, way of doing business, just as uh, Proto alluded to. Dave. Well, I was discussing this with someone the other day that they're offering things like proofreading your emails and uh, maybe uh, changing the tone of the words you're using. And this can be very effective to people who are quick to respond to their boss on email and find themselves in deep trouble for making a snide remark or something. And so it might help in terms of training people to learn to write in a certain way and, and work in a professional way and to avoid having some of the pitfalls that happen when you respond too quickly on a text or something. I can't help but thank the comment that John made about the being this being the future and seeing someone after a long discourse and complimenting them on their AI flavor. Oh, you know, your AI is much nicer these days. Really good today. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, if nothing else, hopefully we'll be able to start getting then and then correctly in our emails. Oh, then we'll be all right. Then. then. Well, uh, speaking of our second hour discussions, we're not there yet. Uh, feel free to put your questions into uh, our chat. We have a fine panel uh, full of expertise. Also, Saturday is our education hour. So we do have some educators here for our general topics. We will have a specific uh, second hour dealing with AI in our second half, but feel free to put in your questions into Mukana and also vote on those questions to make sure that we're covering the topics that you want to hear about. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas. Uh, comment on ClearCom's Arcadia Central Station. Uh, described as a scalable IP intercom platform that deals with HelixNet, FreeSpeak, ClearCom Encore, and other two-wire and four-wire endpoints, and third-party Dante devices, all in a single integrated system. This was shown at Cinegear. Fantastic. And um, if you've noticed our flurry of Cinegear-inspired questions, it's because while we have our official coverage, of Cinegear coming up after the show. We've uh, treated our After Hours group to some Cinegear previews yesterday in our After Hour discussion. So a lot of our crews have gotten to be able to see uh, some of the coverage and some of the products that we've had. Now, I haven't actually got to see or uh, do any research on this particular topic, but it's quite, um, it's quite helpful to um, to come into the show and um, on after hours, what we've been doing with our productions lately is doing some more informal coverage. In fact, um, some of the places that we've decided to visit for our senior gear coverage, we've uh, put it up to you uh, to give us input for that. So that's the way that we're uh, that's the way we're covering things. But Paul, we'll have to we'll have to wait until we get some more exposure before we can get you some comment on that. 
Let's go to our next question. Mm -hmm. Tony Mobley is asking, I have a standalone Mac Mini for use with Zoom ISO. At this time, he has installed Parsec, Zoom ISO, and Zoom Meeting, and he's wondering what else should be on this Mac Mini. All right, let's start off with Samuel. Well, I would say as little as possible, uh, except what you really need. Uh, because uh, if you're uh, running out ISO and uh, sending out either NDI or over a decklink card, then you really don't want to do too much other things on the same uh, computer at, uh, at that time. So I would say only what you need for the job. Got our sheet. I would second that. And also to add, I know loopback is a very vital tool. So uh, that was not mentioned in your description there. So uh, loopback and uh, even audio hijack, just in case if anything else fails with some ISO and stuff in the process, I would add that in that workflow. And Ronnie. Well, uh, normally you also have uh, some Dante uh, software going in and out. So Dante virtual sound card would be uh, perfect uh, to send audio to and from. Uh, another thing that um, we always have on the on the Zoom ISO machines is, of course, the the um, timer system and uh, you could also have uh, intercom like unity unity server is a little a little software that does not take a lot of resources so that's just a suggestion yes and if you need any uh, help filling up your hard drive just let us know we'll, we'll help you with that let's go to our next question Douglas Carmichael is asking, rumors are high that Apple will introduce a 15-inch M2 MacBook Air at WWDC this year. Why do you think Apple would introduce a 15-inch MacBook Air while leaving the MacBook Pro at 14-inch and 16-inch? Jeffrey, care to weigh it? Well, here's the deal. Uh, so WWDC has introduced hardware into uh, it for, for the year. Uh, but the, a lot of times when they've introduced that hardware, they've always introduced some sort of innovation for it. Like, for instance, a couple of years ago when the M1 chip first came out, the the, the hardware that they showed off was, uh, uh, I believe it was the MacBook Air, but it was also the Mac Mini, because you could actually get that Mac Mini, the developers could get that Mac Mini, so they could start developing for the new uh, silicon uh, silicon wafer. With that said, it doesn't make any sense to put out a 15-inch MacBook Air in many different reasons, especially an M2 one. If anything, the, the next generation chip would be put in, and then they'd say, okay, we're going to add the 15-inch to the lineup. Uh, and then maybe, because uh, they have, what, the 13-inch, the 13-inch, 15-inch, whatever. Uh, for MacBook Pro with 14, 16, having a 15 in the middle, doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's an extra skew right there. So why would they why would they build up for one inch difference? Uh, maybe a 17 inch MacBook Air might be the the better option, but I don't see that happening at all in the MacBook Air at, at all at all ever. So I could be wrong. Of course, that's not 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 unusual right there. But the whole point is that a 15 inch MacBook Air at WD, WDC would most likely have some sort of new innovation to it, maybe a new plug, a new port, Thunderbolt 5, M3, M2, double C probation, whatever whatever it is inside to make it something that they talk about and have need the developers to develop for that platform. Otherwise, uh, it, any of the other events that Apple does, introducing a MacBook, uh, MacBook 15 inch makes more sense. Let's go to our next question. It's from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. Last month, 4,000 jobs were lost to AI. Goldman Sachs reports eventually 300 million jobs could be lost globally. For those in production, are we going to get so overwhelmed by AI info that we stop dealing with it, or will it dominate our discourse? Go ahead, Dr. Clark. I have a cute little story that's a counter narrative to the uh, panic about losing jobs. Um, one of my grandsons works at the Tempe Center for the Arts, and they have a very sophisticated uh, fire detection system, basically smoke smoke alarm network that um, detects tiny 
uh, particles that are thrown off by smoke. And they're very sensitive detectors. Uh, and they, they started giving false alarms, probably because of smoke that was coming down from Canada all the way, you know, thousands of miles north uh, due to the large uh, brush fires in Canada. And, and so the Tempe Center for the Arts Administration hired additional people to replace the computerized or artificially intelligent smoke detector system. So the failure of AI actually generated jobs for a while here in Tempe, Arizona. And John? Yeah, I don't think that AI is going to come and take any of our jobs, but a person wielding AI might. And what I mean by that is it's not helpful for us to run for the hills and hide from AI. It's not helpful for us to ignore AI and say, oh, it will never be as good as me. It's helpful for us to engage with the tools to see, does it help you do better at your job? And what I'm seeing in the training world right now is a lot of trainers saying, well, AI will never replace me because I know how to listen well to my stakeholders. And that's a little bit silly because as language models get better trained and are given more specific data, they also will learn how to ask probing questions. They also will learn how to ask how to measure results. And so to just ignore it isn't going to help anybody. But I do think the difference between AI and other technological innovations in the last 20 years is that it makes us way more efficient. Whereas the internet was a whole new thing, a lot of new industries were created. AI is going to make us more efficient, so fewer people are needed to do the same or better job. Um, so think of it more like the steam engine, which was an enabler of different industries, uh, rather than the internet, which is a whole new creative mindset, if that makes sense. Um, I don't think it's as impactful as the steam engine necessarily, but it that's the impact it will have on our economy. And John Prado. Well said, well said, John. I'm doing a presentation on Wednesday in front of a big group here in Vegas, and the final conclusion of my slide says, AI won't take your job. The person who knows how to use it will. And Ronnie. Well, at least uh, AI could be knowledgeable. I had my colleague and, and son, um, Simon, do a, a check with ChatGPT. Do you know what Office Hours Global is? And the answer is yes, I'm familiar with the concept of Office Hours Global. It refers to a virtual platform, a program where professionals, experts, or industry leaders are offering designated hours for consultation and mentoring of global audience. These sessions can take place through video calls, webinars, or other online communication tools. Office Hours Global provides an opportunity for individuals to seek guidance, advice, or ask questions related to a particular field or topic. It is a way to connect with experienced individuals and gain insights of support in a virtual setting. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Douglas Carmichael. Josh, you mentioned cellular networks as having lower latency than internet-delivered voice communication. Wouldn't the inverse be true, especially with modern digital networks? Um, well, Douglas, um, when looking at the latency, the design of it will um, the design of your latency will suit the usage that you're using. So, if you're in a video conference, the first word of a video conference is video. And so um, being able to transmit the large uh, saturated uh, bandwidth of video along with the audio means that the video, if you want to keep the audio and video in sync, is going to slow things down. Uh, to be able to have um, less interruptions, there's going to be some latency that's programmed into the transmission medium. So uh, a system that's meant to just use um, highly compressed, low bandwidth um, audio from point to point versus one that's also lockstep with video means that it's going to slow that down. That's why typically whenever we, when we encounter sync errors, we usually have to slow the audio down because it tends to transmit a faster. Uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Well, uh, back in the days where we have uh, only uh, analog phone lines, there were actually absolutely the lowest latency we could have. And then we have a, uh, 
a few uh, decades where uh, digital uh, communication has increased and now we are seeing um, that uh, latency is on its way down due to better uh, bandwidth, uh, more responsible equipment, uh, better technology and uh, at least um, uh, or at last uh, a better uh, compression algorithm for the, for the transportation. So we're on, on the right way. Samuel? Yeah, I would just say that it has to partly to do with the packets, how they're how they're divided up. For example, here I've got a wireless ISP, and when uh, doing a Zoom uh, 1080p, it was breaking up, and now I'm using a, a cellular connection, and it's the the signals come from the same place, uh, but uh, the, the it gets transmitted in different packets, so it doesn't break up like it did before. Yeah, I think um, I think being uh, last three years, our experience have sort of conditioned us <laughs> for the latency. We, you know, we can tell the the uh, video conference um, veterans because we're kind of and we're almost conditioned to it at this point. Uh, and see see low latency. I I, I feel that my uh, ability to to test or to to notice the off sync has diminished since I've just kind of gotten used to it unfortunately. So hopefully things will, things will be better in the future. Let's go to our next question. It's from John Foltz in Sling, Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Why I can't say that? I don't know. Yesterday we heard about using an iPhone tethered to BMD cameras, Blackmagic design cameras, for live production. Can we get more details on that? Ronnie. Yeah, it was me that mentioned it. We we have uh, a few URSA broadcasts in our uh, facilities, and um, the way that works is that you just have a USB cable coming out from the back of the camera where the SDI and, and on other cameras HDMI ports are. Uh, we connect that directly with a USB-C to Lightning uh, cable into an iPhone, for instance, 13 and 14, which is then uh, on the cellular network. Um, the cellular network will then be used to transport um, video and audio coming from the camera uh, into a given IP address, uh, in this case uh, our control room, where we have a, a few of the uh, Blackmagic uh, uh, bridges uh, receiving the signal. That one is connected uh, through uh, SDI into the uh, uh, vision mixer or, or image mixer. and. Uh, we can have communication going back uh, towards the same link uh, out through uh, through the internet and back to the camera via the cell network. So uh, we, we use that with with a few uh, options, and you can uh, you can have a normal to to low latency, not as uh, quick as uh, as the Zoom is, but uh, definitely usable and uh, a good, um, very cheap replacement for. Uh, a twenty-five thousand dollar backpack from uh, from the blue uh, the blue company. Uh, so um, we we uh, we can use that um, going live and uh, also have communication. You can also remote control the camera from the studio uh, or the software uh, running in the control room. So you have uh, you can have uh, people doing this that are not as uh, good at doing the technical parts of the camera and still have uh, a very good picture. Fantastic. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Paul Walthus in Austin, Texas. How does AGI, artificial general intelligence, differ from real world AI and quantum super intelligence, which are quantum leaps beyond chat GPT-4? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I'll start us off that artificial general intelligence is a sort of term for the application of AI and machine learning in a general purpose sense. The others are specific to the technology you're using to generate or work with AI. So the interface with the AI is with a super quantum computer. That's going to speed up the process and it's going to make it more dynamic, but it's not going to be changing what general applications it's used for. And when we get to ChatGPT, that's a language learning model interface. That's where we're working mostly with words. We're now getting image models. We're getting audio models. We're starting to see process models for industry. So the models are being built, and they'll all be applied to what we're generally calling 
uh, artificial intelligence. I'm beginning to use the term augmented intelligence, where it helps a person and assists them rather than takes over or replaces them. John Preto. Well said, Dave. Uh, Paul, you need to watch my presentation on Wednesday. We're not sure if we're going to stream it live or not, but it certainly be recorded. I have a Venn diagram that shows the hierarchy of what we're witnessing here. Machine learning is a subset of, of AI and vertical AI applications like ChatGPT, known as vertical AI. Artificial general intelligence um, are saying and, and, and uh, forecasted by by Raymond Kurzweil back in 1999 in his book, Age of the Spiritual Machines, at 2029. And he's going to be really, really close to that, at which time that they reach or exceed human intelligence. Whether or not they use a quantum computer or a traditional computer is immaterial uh, in that regard. Yeah, and John, I, I believe that um, some of the terminology that uh, people have been using for real-world AI is that um, like Tesla's Optimus, where it's actually dealing with the, the outside world and making decisions as opposed to something that's being assisted or impeded. Do you think, would you say that's accurate? I, I say all the applications that we have today are, are machine learning and, and a subset of AI overall. Uh, and then artificial general intelligence is another Venn diagram enclosed. It got the... And, is got those two enclosed inside of that. It's it's told very very clearly in a Venn diagram, the hierarchy. Let's go to John Snyder. Yeah, I think it helps us also to think about what do we mean by intelligence and how are humans different than machines, or how is how are organic brains different than machine brains? And one of the biggest difference so far has always been machines are binary. They're you put something in, it calculates exactly what you put in, whether or not your calculations are accurate. You might have bugs or you might have errors, but it spits out what you put in. Um, and there's no error in the sense of um, the machine does what it's told perfectly. Human brains, on the other hand, are constantly um, scanning the environment for new inputs, self-correcting. And um, it's using your brain is using essentially a statistical model of the world around you. Um, for example, what you think you are seeing is small snapshots of the world around you with your brain interjecting the missing information. And that's why sometimes you do or don't see things you think you see is because your brain's actually adding information to the um, what your eyes are detecting from a physical sense. And that's how we do everything all the time in our brains. Computers so far haven't been able to have that same sort of interconnected network of nodes, and they don't really do a lot of self-correcting yet. And so uh, one potential for future artificial intelligence is to have computers approach the world with a, um, a statistical and corrective mindset rather than a mathematical binary mindset. It's just how we haven't had the computing power necessary to be able to achieve that yet. Dr. Clark. I just wanted to add that uh, the term general intelligence has been used in, in IQ testing and in the psychology of learning for uh, many decades. And it's, it's sort of the holy grail. It's what um, testers hope is measured by the IQ test um, as distinguished from say mathematical intelligence or verbal intelligence, which are measured differently um, by focusing on um, test items that refer specifically to mathematical reasoning or, or verbal uh, vocabulary and, and so forth. So that uh, general intelligence is, is sort of from a human point of view is a mysterious, but uh, you know it when you see it, um, kind of phenomenon. And I think the hope of the AI guys is that um, eventually a supercomputer will be able to act as, as John Snyder just said, um, with the same kind of lateral thinking and um, creative general um, knowledge of the world in ways that um, can solve novel problems and respond in contextually sensitive ways rather than um, by uh, 
as John said, calculating the ones and zeros and coming up with a, a precise answer that may well be off the mark, but it's very precise and quick. Okay, Dave? Well, getting back to the silo uh, portion of the discussion in machine learning, I'm kind of thinking, and this may be just Dave predicting something, until we get a, a silo for emotional intelligence, I, I don't think we're going to feel they're human enough to interact with. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. The, um, you know, the the apprehension to dealing with them. Sometimes they they seem a lot more confident than they uh, deserve to be. So, uh, you know, trust but verify. Let's go to our next question. Wise words. Harshad Trivedi brings a Daytona Beach question. It feels like I've been away from the audio end for a while, but aside from the MV7 or MV7X from Sure, what mic would you recommend for a woman's voice, which can offer both voiceover and be easily used for singing as well? And Jeffrey will get us started. I'm assuming you're talking about home stuff, uh, Harshid, uh, and not live stage, even though uh, some of the recommendations will work over uh, back and forth. And it also really depends on the female voice. If it's a, uh, if it's a high-pitched female voice or if it's a, a quiet voice versus a loud voice, things like that. Uh, the SM58s uh, for dynamic mics, the MV7s, they have a range of 50 hertz to about 16 kilohertz. So they can take almost any voice, especially for speaking. That'll be perfect for anything uh, online. It, in On stage, a lot of times, I, I use a lot of Shure microphones. So Shure uh, SM, or the Beta 87, is the one that a lot of people will switch out for female vocals if they don't have enough power in their vocals, if they don't have, if they need the more range, because that's a range of 50 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So you have that, but then you have a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, the, a lot of the different types of condenser microphones, uh, Neumann TLM will be a, be a good one, uh, AK. GC414, I can speak, uh, is another one. Uh, but the Beta 58s, the Beta 87s, those will work as well. And this one right here, the MV7, will be just fine for the average female voice. And Harshi, would you like to qualify your question? Yes, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, so with the fact of Shure uh, SM57, what I've learned from a question that was posted a few months back is the accessibility of having the DSP on it is not quite useful for a blind person or a low vision person. So the MV7 kind of is out the window in that regard. And then as far as uh, audio gain, the MV7X does give you better gain compared to the combo USB and that. So um, if anybody else wants to even chime in, uh, I know Sennheiser has the E935 or the E835s. Uh, just to get you in the door kind of with uh, some sort of range and sound. Um, and then as far as what I'm using currently, it's a $100 mic, which is the SE Electronics B7 microphone. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of get a range because, of course, there have, new, there are been, there have been new microphones that have been released uh, from Rode and others alike. So I just wanted to kind of get a, a panel consensus. But thank you so much, Jeffrey, for that answer. All right, we'll go to Ronnie. Well, um, uh, in addition to what uh, everything uh, uh, Jeffrey said, um, we are uh, we, we are looking uh, at a new uh, thing coming from Audix that we saw at NAM. I, I don't know if you remember that, Jeffrey, but uh, they have this uh, new and, and you didn't say if you wanted an, a USB interface on it uh, or or just an ordinary XLR. But Audix um, unveiled the PDX720, uh, which is a really good microphone. It's also expensive, though. All right. Yeah, we always have our uh, eye on the pulse of audio. And for those listening, Wednesday is our, a fantastic day to find where all of our professionals show up eventually, not all at the same time. Let's go to our next question. I always call that Jeff Day because so many of them are named Jeff. Uh, Paul Wallhouse has the next question. If your survival depended on going viral in a YouTube video, what would you do? Have you ever had a viral video yourself or know someone who has? Go ahead, Jeffrey. So my first viral video actually happened in 2008 because I got the Kodak ZI8 
in for review and, and I put together a big review. Th there's so many different factors in going viral. Uh, either you put it in a spot that a lot of people watch it or uh, you have a place uh, or they just come to congregate it, or uh, it's just a topic that nobody else is covering that needs to be covered. Uh, two t the second time that I went viral was a very interesting product that uh, I did at CES, but it didn't go viral until a year and a half later when Woot.com decided they decided to close out the uh, product because it was a it was a device that you could put on a laptop to turn it into a touch screen. And uh, Woot.com uh, discounted it for like one third the price. And somebody ended up linking in my video in the Woot forums. And uh, next thing I know, um, my website was uh, kind of exploding and I had to uh, up the up the uh, amount of people that could actually uh, uh, get on, on the website because it kept crashing. Uh, so viralness is, is, is a very interesting thing. Uh, there is no one thing because two people can do a, uh, a YouTube video on the same product. They could have the exact same script. They could have the exact same this, the B-roll, everything. But then people just go to, from one to the other. And uh, then you find that one person's got a million views and the other person's got 150. So uh, uh, there is no really good answer to that unless you're, unless you're putting money behind it and uh, trying to get viewers that way. Ronnie? Well, uh, this is not a viral video, but we did a broadcast, a live, uh, live stream a few years back. This was before COVID. Uh, we were expecting a few hundred um, uh, viewers. Uh, this is a very small uh, local dog show, um, which was uh, done mostly as a, um, as a friendly guest, uh, guest share for, for, for these people. We ended up having more than 10,000 10, viewers and was really, really uh, uh, not following the numbers while this was going on and was a little bit shocked uh, afterwards when we checked uh, stats. Yeah, Paul, I'd have to say um, everything that Jeffrey said, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you're trying to create uh, a video, I would say first thing you would need to go viral is a lot of luck followed by circumstance and then having a video uh, <laughs> replaced. But if you're trying to create one and if someone threatens you, first of all, don't uh, sign any contracts that require you to make uh, via videos. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that, that bet, but you're, you're swinging from the fences. You're using a different uh, motivation of video creation. Um, it's not as though uh, some people are in it for longevity, consistency, they build up a community and they, produce videos for different motivations. Um, but viralness is something that sometimes happens with good explanation and sometimes that doesn't. Um, so people that might be trying to, uh, as you say, go viral, they're going to be on the outskirts. They're going to be striking out a whole lot of times, always swinging for the fences for something that's, you know, outrageous or just a little extra. And of course, like I said, you know, it's, it's uh, subject to all of the things that, uh, that regular videos and circulation have. So um, don't recommend putting yourself behind the curve uh, to be able to produce such a video, but it is a different motivation um, of producing videos. Everyone's produces content for different reasons and they are, their audience find them for different reasons. Typically people who produce a viral video uh, don't produce a second one. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Well, I was just thinking when you mentioned luck that there is no actual formula for creating a viral video. That's the whole notion of viral. It happens by itself. It's It's got its own momentum. It has its own moment in time. It's got its 15 minutes of fame. And you can't know if next week your video is going to go viral. It has to do with an audience that you haven't met yet who all want to hear about something. So if there were a formula, of course, there would be no such thing as a viral video. We'd all have the most popular videos. That's right. We'd all have assigned reading and viewing. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, and everybody, there, there's a lot of people that chase this dream uh, and to the point where, like, for instance, uh, TikTok or, or YouTube, for that matter, I've seen people put up a video and then look at the numbers within 24 hours. If they get almost nothing, they'll take the video back down and they'll put it up again later. Maybe they'll tweak this or tweak that and, and put it up again. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty uh, viral thing. The other thing is uh, 
if you really want to get good numbers on a video, you're looking, you should look at the trends. Like for instance, uh, and I, I had actually talked about this on, uh, on another group that I was with uh, yesterday, uh, going to like Twitter, for example, and seeing what the Twitter trends are and then being able to, uh, to bring in your content from that. So if somebody, if the Twitter trend today was, well, yesterday was probably National Donut Day because that's our, yeah, yesterday was National Donut Day. So if you had some video about yourself stuffing your face with 550 donuts, maybe that could go viral on that day. Uh, so there is a little bit of planning on your viral video, you know, like the Mark Rober and, and his, uh, his uh, glitter bombs and, and things like that, is, is bringing in an idea and bringing in a theory and then having a whole bunch of people say, this is cool, watch this. And then you'll get some uh, vir virility to that, and uh, and go from there. So, but yeah, it's it's sometimes it's just it's just a, a crapshoot, basically. And Dr. Clark, one way to answer your question, Paul, is to ask yourself what would antiviral programming look like? What could you do to make sure that a video never went viral? and then do the opposite of those things. But think, I think the title especially is something that could be an attractant or, or not. It could be redundant, uh, perceived as redundant or boring or just another one of, of many choices. But if you're uh, more thoughtful and clever about titling, that might help uh, drive a little bit more interest offer some same uh, advice, uh, Dr. Clark. Most of us have spent three years trying to avoid the virus. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Harshid Trivedi on Daytona Beach. I currently use the SSL2 for my audio interface. What would you recommend for the most tactile interface where it doesn't rely on software to adjust the unit? Why would you prefer it over other devices? Budget is under $500. Go ahead, Dave. This is a really tough question in the first place because most interfaces require visual uh, confirmation of what you're doing. The dials have numbers. They're little flashing things telling you you're overdriving, or there's confirmation numbers, or even a spectrum showing you what you're you're producing. So I find this really interesting that you're going to try and find something that in the tradition of audio engineering and audio interfaces, uh, and preamps, they all have some aspect of them, switches and dials and roll-off uh, the filters and the sort of things that are offered as features are all requiring a, a visual aspect. So a uh, tactile interface would be a real innovation. I think some of the road material uh, that I've been looking at, uh, Rode has come out with the uh, Podcaster and the uh, Pro. These seem more tactile. And once you've set them up, they respond really well to pre-programmed things. But if you say you don't want software and it doesn't rely on it to be able to adjust things in the unit, yeah, you're going to have to go with knobs and dials or sliders and in some sense, trust your ears and not rely on the visual. So yeah, that's a, you presented a really challenging question. And I think the challenge goes to the whole industry. Uh, why can't mixing consoles operate more tactile and give you feedback that is tactile. Even in the sliders, you can tell if something's overdriving by vibrating the slider. And then the person wouldn't need to monitor the uh, the meters as closely or wouldn't be ignoring a meter that is overdriving. So it might be that we have more what they call, um, what's the feedback they talk about on phones? It's uh, haptic. Uh, haptic feedback in a lot of consoles would probably help in that regard. Go ahead, Ronnie. Well, Zoom has a few uh, uh, interfaces as well, uh, but but as Dave uh, just said, uh, Rode has a lot of new uh, products uh, launched this uh, this uh, spring. So I would really look into those. Most of the other interfaces, uh, like normal audio in in and out cards, are getting less and less buttons and more and more software. So I see your pain. I will offer um, one suggestion for you, Harshi. There is um, someone in, actually in our community, uh, George the Tech, as often 
on on our Wednesday, uh, Wednesday audios, and he's been working on a project. That's not it. He's been working on a project with the Passport VO. It's a device that he's um, just getting started up with prototyping that is specifically made to give to talent that is simple and interface. And as you can see, a lot of the buttons there are tactile. So you might um, look at that. It looks like he's doing a preliminary first round run on it. But um, yeah, that might be something that's helpful, um, especially since I believe the the niche that he was trying to address with that was something that he could send to a talent uh, and just have just very minimal input and selection, or even it could be preset and then sent to the talent and, and they wouldn't have to touch it at all. So it might be something worth checking out. Let's go to our next question. Catherine Harrop from Halifax, Nova Scotia is asking, this is a job posting recently put on LinkedIn, a short contract to help train a company's language model. It does make me think of Vonnegut's player piano. Any thoughts? Go ahead, John. Yeah, really quickly. Um, I Training a model is probably a different job than what you're training the model to do. And so it's unlikely that training the model will cause the immediate loss of other jobs. Um, likely what it's going to do is reduce meaningless work for the workforce. And from the call center industry, a good example is if we can help people with their problem before they even get to a human agent, it's faster for them, more convenient for them, and just as reliable as a human, why wouldn't we um, enable them to self-serve so that we can save our human efforts for those complex cases that really need the human touch and even have extra time for that human touch. Um, I've not read Player Piano myself, but one of my friends, ChatGPT, has. So I asked ChatGPT this question, and the summary was, in the end, it's up to us, the creators and users of these language models, to shape the narrative of our technological future. May we strive for a harmonious coexistence between man and machine, where the unique qualities of the human spirit are not diminished, but amplified by our creations. That's exactly what GPT would say. Let's go to our next question. Our next one's from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. How big is too big for a client monitor? Clients are generally between 5 and 15 feet from that screen. All right, well, Jeffrey and Ronnie. So it really depends on if you're talking inside the studio or outside the studio, if you're talking on, on an outside shoot uh, where they need to be uh, underneath a hood, then you want to, you, you can't get too big, uh, but you definitely want to have something that's going to have enough brightness so they can see that. So I would probably would stick uh, on the lower end of things. In the studio, if you have, like, for instance, like I have a monitor and a camera so I can see uh, people's faces and look at the camera at the same time. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, if you're talking, uh, we'll say 15 feet away, I'm a big fan between anywhere between 42 to 50 inches, because especially if you're reading or looking at things, because if you're looking at this corner of the screen, then all of a sudden the eyes are not there at the middle. Um, of the camera, but uh, in smaller uh, monitor like a 42, 50 inch monitor that's that's even farther back from the camera, you're perfect on there. The only problem is that sometimes that camera blocks some of the stuff that they might see from there. But uh, if you're just basically, if the client's just basically watching what's going on, a nice inside of a studio, you know, a nice 50 inch monitor, uh, maybe even 70 inch monitor that if there's no camera in front so they can see what the action is and uh, and go from there but uh yeah those i'd say anything above 70 inches might be overkill okay and ronnie well i'll say it depends um sometimes in the studio we have several things on the monitor and uh, divide it up uh, for instance in in two halves or or a quad um but generally as a confident screen or, or the display or just to to watch your cell phone uh not not smaller than 42 inches uh we've seen that uh, they they tend to ask for bigger ones if you put a 30 inch or even a 24 inch in front of them so that is too small um hanging down from uh, from below a camera for prompting it's perfect to have a 24 inch uh, at that distance and we also have uh, 75 inches if we are putting them back, as uh, Jeffrey said. Next question. 
It comes from Douglas Carmichael. A recent study found that junior remote workers receive less feedback and mentoring than in-office workers. How do you cultivate inclusivity amongst a distributed organization? And he's referring to a New York Times article. John Snyder. Bad management is bad management, whether it's in-person or remote. Um, a lot of managers were never taught how to lead their teams well, whether in-person or remote. It just becomes more obvious when you're uh, distributed. Next question. Next one's from Simon Hofsoy in Tromsø, Norway. What emerging trends or technologies do you believe will have the most significant impact on our industry? And how can we best prepare ourselves to embrace and leverage those enhancements in our careers? I think um, one of the things that we should be looking forward to is since people have much more choice, being finding a way to allow your audience to engage, um, having a reason to tune in, um, providing some value in that sense, I think we'll have a lot of uh, a lot of value there. Um, that is a harder uh, style of production, particularly when it's done live. Uh, but I believe um, giving people a reason to tune in and so that they uh, do have a, a say in the production or being able to uh, participate on a show like this where they can produce, uh, ask questions and be able to have real-time input and be able to interact and chat. Go ahead, Harshi. I'm going to just be biased here into accessibility. Uh, it's changing what we're thinking and doing with products. So it's involving everybody. It's not just people that need it. And it's involving the creators and stuff. So accessibility is a great trend to really focus on. And it's going to be a big impact overall because it's covering everybody and making it more inclusive. Next question. It comes from Tony Mobley in Newman, Noonan, Georgia. With the explosion of robotics and AI, are preparing current students for the world that they live in? Are we preparing current students for the world that they live in? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, the answer is basically no. We can only prepare them for the past and the present. We can't prepare them for the future because we don't know what the future is. We're in the infancy of AI. We're in the infancy of metaverse. That's still a thing. Uh, so anything out in EXA, uh, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality or anything like that, uh, we're, we're still learning how we can bring that all together and make that happen. 20 years from and think about it, 20 years ago, what do we have today that we didn't have 20 years ago? Like for instance, the iPhone, we didn't have the iPhone. We had phones and they were starting to get smart, but they didn't get to the point that, the, that an iPhone or an Android phone has nowadays. So in 20 years, what technologies are going to be there, especially that are AI driven, that are VR driven, that will, uh, that will uh, forge the next generation. So the only thing that you can do is teach them what's present and teach them what's in the past. And hopefully they'll see the trend and then they'll be the uh, trailblazers for whatever is in the future. Next question. It's from Harshid Trivedi. What interface would you say has the most compact build and decent preamps? I actually think this passport thing that John Josh mentioned is terrific. I think it's compact, easy to use, and I imagine it has decent preamps as it's being made by audio people. Yeah, good, good call. If it, if compactness is your uh primary um, uh, criteria then, Harshit. Some of the ones that have the USB interfaces, their interfaces are built in. You can't get much more compact than that. Let's go to our next question. Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado is asking, could you see AI adding, um, yeah, like, to audio to make baby boomers seem more relevant and contemporary? Go ahead, Jeffrey. I don't know if I've ever heard a baby boomer go, oh, yeah, uh, but, you know, that's always possible. The reality is uh, we're always looking to try and remove that stuff using AI, not add that stuff using AI. On that, uh, on that aspect, I suppose, yeah, there I did, I just, the, uh, oh, yeah. On that aspect, I suppose there are people that want to have that more organic feel to a conversation. Like for instance, I, I was editing a podcast for somebody years ago and they say, I don't want you to remove the ums and ahs because that makes the the show feel a little bit more organic or a little bit more uh, uh, 
in line like we're like we're talking like I am now we're trying to figure out our words um, but there are shows where it's like I don't want those ums I want that to go f uh, fast and easy and then of course we have things like the new Premiere Pro and uh, and uh, DaVinci Resolve that have the text generation editing where we can take out the ums and ahs and have a more streamlined answer and streamlined show for you so I it's not impossible that it's that it's not being done, but the reality is people want to take out that stuff before they want to add it. Well, thank you, our producers and our panel for providing us with the questions and the show uh, material. Um, don't go anywhere. We're going to go right into our second hour, which is our education hour. But before we do, um, we do have our, our lineup for next week set. So if you haven't, go to officehours.global, sign up to get our daily email. We have, of course, uh, WWDC. We're looking forward to next week. We have that book ending, our, uh, our events for next week. We have the WWDC keynote discussion we'll have on Monday, and we'll finish up with a wrap-up on Friday. On Tuesday, um, we have a special treat. We have the author of Let's Make, uh, Let's Make Letters, uh, Kelsey Gray, uh, available. So she'll be talking to us about typography. You want to, you don't want to miss our graphics day next week, Wednesday, we're going to have elk live, which is a low latency audio solution. They're, they're back again. And Thursday we have the zoom update. Just a hint. You never want to miss the zoom updates. That's all we can tell you for now, but let's go into our second hour of discussion. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Josh. Uh, today we have a bit of a hands-on second hour for education. Summertime is such a great time to learn something new. So before we leave on our summer hiatus in a couple of weeks here, uh, we wanted to demonstrate for our teachers and educators some ways that you practically can use AI tools to create a lesson plan. And I'm going to be spending most of my time today in ChatGPT. Uh, there are lots of different tools you can use. We'll even point at some of those uh, more obscure tools to see ways other than just text prompting that you can use AI. So I want to encourage everybody who's watching today to open up your AI text generator of choice. Um, another good one, if you're an educator in limited budget, you can always use Bing Chat, which uses the ChatGPT4 model. Uh, one of the big things about the Bing Chat is it doesn't have doesn't allow as large of an input or output, nor does it do as good of a job remembering context from prompt to prompt because it's really designed to do a, a quick answer. Uh, one thing that's nice about Bing is it does cite its own sources, which can be helpful. So as always, we wanna invite our producers to put your questions into Mukana chat and vote for the questions that you want answered soonest. Now that will be driving our show for the most part. So I'm gonna start by just going into ChatGPT. And, and what I've done is yesterday, I actually prepared a few different prompts just so you don't have to hear me typing. It took me about 30 minutes to put everything together yesterday to give you an idea of what you might expect as you get experience in ChatGPT, as you learn how to use it and tune it, um, it's going to go, it will definitely improve your speed. When I used to build lesson plans every single week, it would take me at least two hours, usually closer to four or six hours to do what I accomplished yesterday in about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. But before I do, if there's anyone in the panel who wants to uh, raise your hand and share any thoughts on uh, AI, that'd be, fine as well. And I'm going to try to make this so that everyone can read it. ChatGPT being text-based um, might have a little bit difficulty. So I've bumped up our font size and you should be able to see my screen now. Okay. Uh, Arshid, did you have some initial thoughts? So the way, the way I'm looking at the AI model of things, it's definitely a help in, in writing, I, I would say. So uh, as writing a lesson plan and to be concise with, uh, you know, the way you format a structure, I think that there is a lot of help. Um, I specifically first dove into uh, BARD. I haven't really dove deep because it's time, uh, haven't had time to spare in it. But um, I think that it's, it's definitely a help. Um, I personally, for let's just say Gmail, love having something even simple as a grammar check or having that ability to rewrite something. So whenever you write a, uh, a lesson plan or what have you, as you're going to show us here further, I think that AI is definitely a big impact 
especially I would say in the disability uh, community, because it could help you get something across uh, even better uh, and more concise. And it, it gives you a little bit more intelligibility to your work. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from you over time, Harshid, which of these tools does better with accessibility as far as you being able to read through the information once it comes back to you. Um, today, I'm going to pretend like I'm a fifth grade teacher. I have a fifth grader, but I've never taught fifth grade. So honestly, I'm trying to do something that I'm a novice at. Uh, and we're going to be exploring how to build a, le a six week lesson plan. So we'll start with a simple prompt. Um, and what I've noticed, most people most of the time, they where they go wrong is having simple prompts. So my prompt to start is create a six week science curriculum for fifth grade students, give the topic title and a brief summary, and I'll say for each week. And we're going to get mediocre results back. And most people I, I read a research study recently that said something like 58% of Americans or as a summary of a research study, I should say 58% of Americans have heard of chat GPT, but only 14% have ever tried it. And I think what we'll find is people who are say it doesn't help very well or it doesn't work well are putting really generic prompts in there and we have to remember that how these models work is it takes a summary of all collected public human knowledge essentially and it summarizes and tries to predict the next most likely word based on what you give it so if you're asking the whole world to create a six-week curriculum for fifth grade science this is what it's going to give you it's going to be a pile of mediocrity which isn't specific, nor does it use best practices and in instruction, because we're summarizing the whole world. And so general prompts like this one will give you really general answers that are generic. Um, there's no better way to say it than when you're not specific, it gives you an average response. And so most people's first experience with these tools, it comes off with something that's not great. So what it uh, spit out in return is the summary students will begin by learning about the scientific method they'll understand how to formulate a hypothesis design an experiment record data and draw conclusions like that sounds pretty good that's about what my kids are doing in their their science classes but there's no pizzazz to this and it's it seems just i know i feel like this is the first answer anyone would give um and that was week one week two they're going to talk about plant biology week three animal biology and then that becomes a real snooze fast. So the first thing you can do to get better at using these tools, and you can see each of these summaries is just really generic. The plant life is moving from plant life to animal life. Students will learn about different types of animals and their habitats. They'll study basic animal anatomy, focusing on adaptations that help animals survive. Students will also discuss the importance of biodiversity and conservation efforts. Well, how do I get my students to do any of that? What kinds of things can I do as a teacher? That almost gave me no insight in how to teach this class. So we want to specify, we want to take that sum of human knowledge, and we really want to focus on a very small sliver of that. And how you do that is in your prompts, you're creating filters. And there's different types of filters you can create. Um, in my opinion, the best prompts are those that have a lot of specificity, um, as well as use a role, context, task, criteria, format. Um, and what I mean by that is first we give the AI a role. So when I gave the answer to the question about um, Kurt Vonnegut earlier today, I actually asked AI, asked ChatGPT to pretend like it was Kurt Vonnegut to write that response. And that gives a different voice to what I get back. So for today, uh, I'm saying you're a fifth grade teacher. So I want AI to think like a teacher. And now it's going to take that all of human knowledge to, to narrow down into kinds of responses and words that are most likely to be said by a fifth grade teacher. You use evidence based principles. So I want I only want it to summarize blog articles or research studies that have phrases that also use evidence based. And immediately this is going to have my response be a lot more specific and act actionable for teachers. Um, so use evidence based principles to ensure learning retention, such as and I'm going to give three specific evidence based principles, uh, spaced repetition, retrieval practice and interleaving. So spaced repetition, retrieval practice, and interleaving are three brain-based principles that have been uh, validated over time to provide a superior retention among students. And I am using the ChatGPT4 model today uh, just to get the very best response I can. And it's going to take ChatGPT a while to come up with this response. So I've put that in. It's calculating the response now while we're waiting. Um, I thought it would go quite a bit faster than this, uh, but it is going along. So 
First response starts out with, absolutely, these are highly effective strategies to enhance learning. Here's a revised six-week curriculum incorporating spaced repetition, retrieval practice, and interleaving. Um, and it uses the same week, so scientific method. And it says, summary students will start with understanding the scientific method. They'll practice each step. And there's almost no change here because the words are the same, but I haven't given any more than a voice. So instead of just saying, you're a fifth grade teacher, that's the role. I want to give it some context. So now I say, I want you to write a six week science curriculum for students that culminates in viewing a live rocket launch. Because we have John Preto here today, uh, he launches rockets. And so we're, I'm thinking, how can we build a lesson plan to go into the next rocket launch? Next, I'm going to give it a task. Well, that's the task is write a curriculum with bullet points. I'm going to give it criteria and a format next. So the format should be a table where each row is one week long. The columns show the week number, the topic title, three learning objectives that use higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, a brief description of the content, and at least one applicable learning activity. So I'm getting way more specific in my prompt now because, again, I want to take that narrow slice and narrow it down further to tell the machine exactly what I want back in the format I want back with the criteria that I want to hear back from. And so this role, context, task, criteria, and then format equation really helps you give what's called a mega prompt. And, and really what you're doing is you're just narrowing the results you get back from your machine. And you can see uh, as we're generating the response uh, that it's actually putting it back in a markdown ta formatted table. So each week will be one row of my table and each my columns are going to be the week number, the topic title, the learning objectives, the content description, and some learning activities that we can actually use in the classroom. So by being more specific, my results that come back are much more along the lines of what I would expect. So week number one, um, I'm going to skip from introduction to scientific method. I'm just going to grab uh, week number three is rocket science basics. Our learning objectives for week three instead of being just a, this is generally what the people are going to be doing, is to define key components of a rocket. So that's my lower level of Bloom's taxonomy is define. Understand and explain the role of each component in a rocket's flight. So now I'm going up one level of Bloom's taxonomy. I want my students to be able to explain how they work together. Uh, analyze how the principles of physics apply to rocket flight. So that feels a little bit advanced for a fifth grader to me, but we're getting closer. The description for the week is that students will delve into rocket science. They'll learn about the basic components of rockets and how they work. They'll understand the application of physics in rocket propulsion and motion. So you can see by giving a much more narrow approach, it's giving me way more thorough responses in a more meaningful format. And then as the learning activities, the students will build a sample model, a simple model rocket, and they'll discuss how each part contributes to its launch and flight. So I'm integrating all these learning. So first I'm putting out the information about how the different parts work together. I'm going to be discussing with the students how these different pieces work so they can under, make sure they're understanding in their head. And then I'm asking them to apply it by building a rocket. I'm asking them to uh, synthesize the information by not only building that rocket, but explaining to me, the teacher, how does that rocket or how does each part that I've built contribute to the results we see when we actually launch the rocket? But by, by giving it more information and more detail, I'm giving the um, chat GPT, it's giving me back a much more uh, appro appropriate response. And uh, this is great, but what I'm noticing here is there's not any interleaving. So I'm not bringing in any information from math or, or English or anything like that. So after you have learned how to create good prompts, the next step in creating a lesson plan is you wanna iterate. And this is really where you get the most value from these tools is by iterating over time by by getting a an output from the machine and then asking it to modify it so my first iteration i'm just going to ask it to incorporate what my students might be learning in english and math into some of the learning activities because why not reinforce what we're learning in math or english in the activities i'm asking them to do While we're waiting for this to generate, I see we have a couple of questions, so uh, we can go to our questions now. Dave, what's our first question going to be? Our first one is from Iris Huff in Lake Wales, Florida. My school insists on standard-based lesson planning. I, I imagine standards-based. 
If I gave it a specific standard, would it focus on just that standard? The thing with AI is it will do its best to respond to the prompt you give it. And so generally, yes, you can give it a specific standard and requirements and ask it to um, apply that to a different situation. So um, in a word, you can get it very close. It's also an assistant. It's also a machine. It's not perfect. I mean, it even says at the bottom of the page on ChatGPT that you might get inaccurate information. Um, you always want to review the results. But yes, you can tell it to bring back the information in a specific format. In ChatGPT version 4 especially, you can actually give it a format and ask it to reproduce that. So you can paste in a format and say, using this format, respond with X, Y, or Z. So, um, and you can even give the format a nickname so you can reference it later. So I'm calling this format standards one. And then later in the conversation, you say using standards one, write a six week science curriculum for um, AI. Dave? Yeah, I was just going to add that maybe the, the question is whether that standard that you're working with, the standards based lesson planning is a published document or something that's, that's available to uh, the language model to be able to draw upon for that standard. So it might mean that on an internal network or a, a school-based AI system, uh, those standards would be included in the model. But it would be a question as to whether that notion of a standards-based lesson planning model is already existent and the uh, language model is aware of it. Great. And what's our next question? From Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, how does a lesson plan translate to an on-demand learning, or does it? Chris? Well, it doesn't. A lesson plan, in my experience, is a way of the teach for the teacher to prepare himself or herself for uh, later uh, interactive teaching. And the, the plan never survives first contact with the students, to paraphrase an old military saying. So it's, it's not so much a script for doing exactly what the plan says, although that's what a lot of novices mistake it for. Rather, a lesson plan is a, is a device to, uh, more like a recipe in a cookbook where you you gather the ingredients that you're going to need and you make sure that you have the uh, weighing and measuring uh, instruments available and you could do the math to adjust for the so the number of people to be served if it's different from what the what the recipe uh, describes uh, but the lesson plan isn't really a script or a plan or it, if it if it's used that way it's usually not very engaging and often stumbles so uh, i'd say on demand learning is is better described by the uh, the i'm blocking on the name of the uh, the famous uh, math tutoring site khan academy uh, in a sense, Khan Academy has anticipated what uh, school-aged people studying math and doing uh, homework problems are, are likely to have trouble with, and they've developed some very, very uh, good, clear, explanatory um, graphics and audio to uh, describe how to solve those particular problems. So I think that's that's closer to the on-demand um, responsiveness than um, AI generating a lesson plan for a teacher. That doesn't take you all the way to the classroom. Great. Dave? Yeah, and, and I'll echo that a little bit, that a lesson plan is a series of lessons planned out. So on-demand is usually directed to a specific requirement or skill development and some specific in the longer term, uh, one of, excuse me, one event out of many, and the lesson plan is a plan through those events all the way through to the final phase of learning. Um, I don't think it does translate. I think a lesson plan is a, a 
it's almost like a um, a project management description. Uh, we're we're going to start here. We're going to go there. We're going to go through to here, and we're going to have these resources at each step of the way. Whereas on demand learning is saying, I need to know this right now. And as he said with the Khan Academy predicting that, we may see that good lesson plans filled with good material and resources can be carved up into on demand review elements or things the students can pre watch before they go to class or even watch after class to get a better understanding or a deeper dive. And going back to our lesson plan. <clears throat> What we can see now, if um, we're sharing the screen, is <clears throat> ChatGPT took our prompt and started interleaving some lessons from math and English at the appropriate fifth grade level. So for week four, where we're exploring space in the solar system, one of the objectives is to analyze the effects of gravity on the planets and their moons. Um, and to identify the components of our solar system, sorry, I, I misread a line, and then evaluate the challenges of space travel. Notice that in our learning activities column, it's now saying students will create a scale model of the solar system using proportions and ratios. So we're learning in math, proportions and ratios. That's an appropriate fifth grade activity. ChatGPT integrated that into my science lesson plan. They'll write a persuasive essay. So one of the things we're learning in fifth grade is starting to learn how to write a persuasive essay uh, on the most suitable planet for human habitations using evidence from what they've learned. So you can see it immediately changed my learning activities to bring in some stuff from math and science. So those are some ways you can iterate on your prompts. The next step that I like to do is um, use other people's prompts because there's no value in reinventing the wheel. And one of my favorite educators is Dr. Philippa Hardman. And she has a whole series of um, mega prompts. And recently she came out with some on how to improve learner motivation. So she uses that same role context examples format. In this case, we're saying you're a learning scientist now who's an expert in designing learning experiences that are optimized for motivation. The context is our learners have increased purpose, attention, and persistence when they learn in the pursuit of answering a driving question. And so this is asking me to give a driving question and should be open-ended and capture the purpose and the bigger goal of the effort of the learner. The goal is to have driving questions to ignite the student curiosity and optimize motivation to learn more. Here are some examples of driving questions. And these examples you'll notice are much higher than a fifth grade level. How can robots, robots help transform healthcare? How does access to transport increase life expectancy? Your task, ChatGPT, is to review my objectives from the outline above, and for each week, write a driving question that will motivate and focus my learners. And oftentimes you think of motivational questions and you think that should be at the start of the lesson plan, uh, but you can add and edit your lesson plan after the fact using these tools. And just really quickly, I'll show in week number four, since that where we, that's where we left off, the driving question for week number four, space in the solar system, is my students should be thinking, what are the challenges of living on another planet? And how could we overcome them to create a new home in the solar system? So maybe I can use that to start the discussion the, with a discussion question with my students. What do you think might be a challenge about living in another planet? And they might come up with social challenges or physical challenges, but it's a way for me to get my students involved in motivation. Or another of uh, Filippo's prompts is one to incorporate growth mindset, which also increases learner motivation. And I'll put all these prompts into our Discord. Um, they're not a secret. I just copied them from Dr. Hardman. But so you don't have to listen to me uh, rail, rail on about these over and over again. Um, I'm asking it to, the task is to review my lesson plan and give some suggestions to me to make sure my learning experiences support growth mindset. And again, growth mindset, for those who aren't familiar, includes things like a safe failure, a way for my students to approach it as I'm trying to learn, I'm not trying to succeed. And so uh, we'll let this calculate for a bit and we'll move into our next question. From Douglas Carmichael, could you see educators hiring prompt engineers to tune their prompts for special needs? Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Well, yes and no, Douglas. Um, I think that th my hope is that educators will begin to learn how to help one another in uh, refining prompts and comparing the results they got from entering these prompts with colleagues' uh, results and so forth. So that it's, it's kind of a skill that I hope doesn't become 
a specialty for hire, but rather something that uh, all educators uh, start to develop and and get feedback and even uh, come to office hours with help uh, phrasing prompts, examples of a very generative and successful prompt um, writing by John Snyder, for example, could be posted and made available on on our Discord server so that um, we would spread this uh, knowledge and, and good examples, generative examples, or make it available for free as widely as possible so that one wouldn't have to necessarily hire a, a ghost prompter, but um, that this would become one of the new adaptive uh, professional development targets for the uh, the teachers of the present and the future. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's very likely that in the short term, um, that's what learning coaches will be used. You know, we have coaches to help teachers teach students how to read. I think it's very likely we'll have a similar thing for prompt engineering to uh, individual positions to help a whole school of teachers get better at prompting. In the long term, we'll have language models and tools that don't need these super specific prompts because they'll be specifically tuned to our context. So maybe there's a drop down for what grade level you're doing, what your topic is, and you just type one or two questions and this whole um, whole workflow gets triggered by that. Um, so I asked uh, our chat GPT tutor to help us with a lesson plan to add some motivational questions and a growth mindset. Um, now what I'm going to do is because it's a little bit hard to read, I'm just going to ask it to add both my driving question and my growth mindset suggestions as separate columns on my original table, uh, just so I can demonstrate that you can have um, a chat GPT, especially because it has that um, memory of this conversation so far, it knows what I mean. The specific prompt I put in was add the driving questions and growth mindset suggestions to the table in my lesson plan. So it went up to my conversation, found the most recent version of my lesson plan. It added a um, growth mindset suggestion and a driving question here. So now it's, and I can copy this and paste it into Excel or whatever to make it really easy for me to read. So again, dealing with week four, I think eh, I'm going to go with week two because that's what we have calculated so far. Uh, the driving question is how do the principles of forces and motion apply to our favorite sports for recreational activities? So you can see it's thinking, how do I get students to apply this to their daily life? Um, and then the growth mindset is used work examples of common misunderstandings. So I'm going to allow my students to fail with those common misunderstandings about forces and motion, such as the misconception that heavier objects fall faster. So maybe my um, lesson plan can include me dropping a, a book with a um, something that's a lot lighter than a book uh, paperclip and showing they fall at the same rate. And I can emphasize that those misconceptions are opportunities to learn more instead of like, oh, no, I failed because I got that wrong. How can this help me get more inquisitive about what the right answer is? So these are some ways you can do to get a, a big overall lesson plan, six week curriculum. You can see how we can iterate. We can use different formats to our prompts to get a better results. But I can even um, ask the AI to expand on one of these. So for my next prompt, I'm going to ask it to write a step by step lesson plan just for week four that gives suggested scripts for the teacher, including estimated time frames for each portion of the lesson and to rewrite any activities that need to be included um, or any activities that need additional options for varied modes of instruction. So I'm, I'm basically saying take week four, flesh that out, give me a step by step uh, how to to teach this week's lesson plan. And while we're waiting for this to calculate, Dave, do we have another question? We do. It's from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. How might this AI replace a traditional tutor or and how might it be deficient as a tutor. Dr. Clark? Well, Roscoe, I think um, in a sense, um, the Khan Academy model is a, a partial attempt to, to provide um, a, a tutoring service. Essentially, it's a, a reteaching uh, kind of a program that goes through um, problems that um, 
that students may be struggling with and, and demonstrates in a step-by-step -step way how, how one might approach the problem um, and, and shows graphically as well as with a voiceover, um, a demonstration of how that, how that problem could be solved. Uh, I don't think it uh, replaces the traditional tutor in the sense that um, tutors, human tutors, uh, number one, uh, ha also have access to a lot more um, social emotional information about the, the person being tutored. Uh, so, so when I'm tutoring or mentoring, I can, I can get a, a rather immediate and rich sense of how my uh, to T or how my uh, advisee is doing uh, emotionally. Are they frustrated by having writer's block or are they puzzled or by their insufficient understanding of how to solve this problem, whether it's a writing problem or um, a mathematical problem or a scientific uh, puzzle to be solved. So, so I can, I can pace myself and and um, take into account in real time the uh, the state of the learner, so to speak, rather than um, one size fits all or one one form of demonstration uh, is relevant no matter what is quote unquote going on with that uh, that student or that learner. So I think at least at this stage of the process of, of the development of AI and the kinds of uh, AI that we have access to, that um, it's not a complete replacement for the learner, I mean the tutor. Um, it can be a partial replacement and it can make available tutoring at a distance or at around the clock in a way that um, is probably not possible for human tutors. So that's kind of an advantage, but the disadvantage is it's uh, less able to be personalized. Yeah, until we get better uh, student profiles, especially, and, and it will also in, enable us to lower the cost and of tutoring and increase the accessibility. Harshid? I think uh, as far as what is the, the replacement part, I think we could all coincide together. Um, when we look at something simple as flashcards, right? To access flashcards these days, no one's writing them on a flashcard and flipping them over to, let's say, practice vocabulary. But in the essence of what the AI can do for you, it could be more interactive. So perhaps you're watching a video on mics and what is an XLR cable? And then you might have a video that's related to it. So I think it's not a replacement necessarily, but it's maybe a, uh, a layer that is added to the teaching model where the human giving the empathy, giving the direction, giving the directive of what is at, at bay of learning, like the, the lesson plan itself, it's giving more uh, creativity to the process and more access just in the value of you don't have to go to flashcard.com or Quizlet or whatnot. You have this uh, availability right within whatever document you're working with, but it gives an enablement to even a fifth grader uh, to understand what they're really understanding and then give them that little bit of interactivity uh, aspect so that they're engaged with the process. Because sometimes when humans talk, we could talk like, wow, this is why zine, and I was like, you, you could talk monotone. Will the student listen to that monotone stu uh, teacher? So I think it gives them a little bit more of a uh, cushion to ask the questions in their own creative way. So perhaps if you did a flashcard and you wanted to know more about a specific or you didn't know a specific vocabulary word in the sentence that was described, I think this actually aids the process, not necessarily replaces the process of tutoring. Thanks, Harshid. What's our next question? It comes from Douglas Carmichael. Do you think we'll ever see self-hostable or on-premises large language models for educational institutions who are concerned about family education rights, compliance, and similar privacy issues? I think privacy is going to be a big conversation in the future, not just with um, large language models, but including them. 
I don't know if we'll have schools integrate their own large language models on their own premises, but I do think there will be additional products that have privacy built into them um, that incorporate some of these same foundational tools because schools like to purchase known products rather than maintain their own individual software. And it's probably not the best use of school funds to hire the infrastructure needed to maintain a single uh, large language model. I don't know what it would take, but that's a whole different ball of wax. I think it's way more likely the school choose to buy that than build it themselves. Uh, we'll go back to our lesson plan now. So again, I've asked the AI to expand on my week four for the lesson plan, which is about space and the solar system. And it's broken it down into a 60 minute lesson. It looks like I haven't read through all of it yet, starting with a warm up. So it starts by saying, let's start with a discussion questions for our students. Use it as an, and it coaches me, the teacher, use this as an opportunity to assess their prior knowledge and to spark their curiosity. A suggested question is, let's discuss what we already know about the solar system. Can anyone tell me what the components are? And then there's 20 minutes of a direct instruction, which might be a little bit long, where it recommends I introduce the different components of the solar system, the planets, moons, asteroids, etc. Um, and the suggestion for the teacher is our solar system is a vast space filled with amazing celestial bodies. Uh, I would not have written something that uh, clever in my first attempt. Uh, let's explore each one, starting with our home planet, Earth. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to actually ask it to take this instruction and turn it into a two minute YouTube video. And we'll see that in just a moment. And then there's an interactive discussion for 15 minutes. And if there's not enough questions here or you want different varieties on the questions, just say, uh, give me three more examples of discussion questions for that 15 minute interactive discussion. Uh, one of the suggestions is gravity is a force that keeps us grounded on Earth, but how does it affect other plants and planets and their moons? So we can try, try to think about like the moon has less gravity. What might that mean? We might try to think through a thought experiment or actually a real experiment to demonstrate what that might look like. And then it ends with a 40 minute activity. Oh, wow. This is really long. This is almost a two hour lesson plan. Wow. Um, whew. <laughs> I would ask it to shorten this up. <laughs> so AI doesn't always get it right the first time, obviously. And I can say, just give it a new parameter, make this lesson 60 minutes or less or 45 minutes or make, you know, I can have it summarize these things. So that's what I would probably do. This is the very first time I'm seeing these outputs from this instruction. When I did it yesterday, it was a 60 minute lesson plan. Um, but it's, you know, there's uh, an activity here that I have students build their a scale model of the solar system. Um, I can to use provided materials. I can ask for a list of materials to purchase as a result of this for this model and what would be a good Jupiter, for example. And the AI can help me with all of those sorts of um, tips and tricks. Um, yeah, this ended up being really long. So then there's another direct in, uh, direct instruction after that and another writing activity for 40 minutes. So this is assuming about half of my day is devoted to science, which is not likely. Even if I broke this up throughout the day, that's too much. So maybe I need to take this week and split it into two separate weeks. And I can ask ChatGPT to do that. I can say, take all the content from week number four, uh, split it into two 30 minute classes, summarize it and give me an assignment for students to reinforce the learning between the two classes. Um, instead, just to make it easier for me, since I've already had copied it, I'm gonna ask it to write me a script for a YouTube video. So I want that uh, direct instruction to be a YouTube video that I can create using AI. So I asked it to write a script for a two minute video, YouTube video, uh, to help illustrate the concepts of, uh, I said propulsion, this is from last time, the solar system from week four. It should replace one of the direct instruction segments. So I'm actually asking ChatGPT now to write a script for me uh, that I can record a video in. While we're waiting for this to calculate, Dave, do we have another question? Oh, yes, we do. From Kjetilfla Gjertsvold in Tromsø, Norway, we have used ChatGPT to rewrite and translate boring text to youth lingo. Do you think this is a viable path for adults to better communicate with younger audiences? What do you think, Arshit? I don't think it is because lingo changes, right? Phrases and terms that we might have used from the 70s to 80s, uh, I dig it, right? Phrases like as such. Well, we still use the word I dig it. Does it mean that that phrase is all gone? So I don't think that lingo really is something that uh, that is built in just yet because we're still trying to build the language model to understand basic communication skills or, or, or term, phrases per se. So I think lingo is more of a... Uh, 
environmental aspect. So if you might be in South Africa, you might have specific lingos or t phrases and terms you might use. In UK, you know, uh, brilliant it might be a phrase or term you use. So I think it depends on where in location that you are that it the lingo may vary. So sure, we could train the language to understand that, but I think the human empathy part is still the key. Chris? I think this is a, a kind of an exciting opportunity for, um, for you uh, to try a little action research experiment. You've, your hypothesis seems to be that it's the, uh, the datedness of the language in the original um, boring text and, and that the uh, change in the, the genre of speech to uh, a younger uh, generation's ways of expressing the same ideas would make a difference. It would make it interesting or engaging rather than boring. So that's a kind of hypothesis that you've tried and you've had help from ChatGPT to make the translation, but now it's time to try it out with a young audience and see if they um, are more engaged with it or if they report that, well, it's the same old boring content uh, wrapped up in, in the language of our generation in a way that could even feel embarrassing. Uh, but we don't know that. It, it could, on the other hand, be uh, quite engaging for all we know. So try it out and then repeat the experiment, continue to generate different versions of this text uh, and try them out with actual students of this younger generation and see whether this is a, a blind alley or a promising uh, development. And Dave. Uh, one of the big lessons I've learned is that if you are a young person and you hear an adult using lingo, you immediately stop using that lingo. So if it became a thing that ChatGPT is trying to be hip and cool, uh, it's likely people will shy away from anything from ChatGPT. Perfect. Now we're going to move on from just ChatGPT and we're going to look at some other AI tools. So I, in the background, I asked ChatGPT to write a script for a two minute YouTube video. Um, and I'll put that script in our Discord so you can see the full script. I've copied three of the paragraphs into my clipboard, um, but I wanted to show a couple other tools so you, you can see that there's more than just ChatGPT. The first one I'm going to show will help us make that video. It's called simpleshow.com. And what it does is you, you input text and it will create an animated video based on the text you do. Um, so you'll see me, I'm going to just click on create new video here. And there's a free version of this as well. Um, I'm just going to call this test two. It's in English. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload those three paragraphs of text, and I'm just going to let it do its, uh, its own attempt. I'm going to start with a blank template. Oh, I should have said it was a learning template. Sorry about that. Let me go back here. And educational blank template. And there's several different templates for this tool. There's a lot of tip sheets and Basically, all I'm doing right now is I'm just pasting the script from ChatGPT. It starts out with, hey there, young scientists. Today, we're embarking on an amazing journey through our solar system. Our journey starts at the heart of the solar system, the sun, a hot ball of glowing gas, providing light and warmth to all the planets. And then uh, the body, you can have, I think it's up to um, seven or 5,000 characters or something. I've just grabbed two paragraphs for the sake of time. Um, and I'm going to end the video right now with... Hope you enjoyed it. See you next week. Again, the full text of the video script um, in ChatGPT, it even suggested like scenes. It suggested what to go on in the background. I've narrowed it down to just the dialogue to show you this other tool. And I'm going to ask it to visualize. Maximum characters has reached now. Oh. Uh, too many. I'm going to move this from the introduction to uh, my body. 
So there are some restrictions on each section because it will make basically one scene for the beginning, the middle, and the end. And while we're waiting for this to calculate, let's go ahead and move into our next question. Our next one comes from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. So could a, a lesson plan just be a series of questions that a student views in a defined order generated by AI or a YouTube video providing the answers? What do you think, Chris? It could be, but I wouldn't recommend that. The issue is that uh, if the questions aren't generated by the learner, then they're less likely to be engaging. But what you described there can be done without and has been done without um, AI being involved. For example, uh, the, the mastery learning approach of um, 40 years ago is a ver variation on this theme of the instructor generating a set of questions or uh, and then linking those uh, sometimes physically and then later through through the internet to the quote unquote answers to those more or less rhetorical questions. But the and then the, the advantage of it, the system was that a, a learner could move at their own pace. They could move right through the questions and take a short test to demonstrate that they remember the uh, key information for 20 minutes, then they pass. They move through that module and into another one. But it it didn't ever really uh, catch on because they weren't the students' questions. What I'd recommend instead is, again, cycling back to the idea of project-based learning where students are actually trying to build something or create something that's slightly beyond their grasp, their competence. And so they, they get engaged in trying to do the first draft version of this model that they're building. And then they have some real questions because they got stuck here or they had a breakthrough there. And they bring these questions to a, a more experienced other, or in this case to AI, and then the AI perhaps uh, can answer the questions in ways that can help the project move forward or make the second version of the, the project, the second draft, uh, more complete, more effective, and generating more questions. And the cycle continues. All right. Well, we're going to go back to our simple show. And this is a a super easy way to make animated videos. They're not super complex. Basically what happens is, um, and we, if we can show the screen here again, um, in this tool, what happens is it takes your script and it identifies what it thinks are keywords and you can choose which words are keywords. So it shows the word today. And when it says the word today, it's going to show a picture of a calendar. It's going to put a little hand's going to put it up there, I believe. We're embarking on an amazing journey at Highlighted, so it found an appropriate clip art for an amazing amazing journey, and it's going to animate that in there through our solar system. And it found a clip art that shows a model of the solar system, and it's going to pop those up. In the next scene, it says our journey, and it uses that same icon with the airplane flying over the Earth. Uh, starts at the heart of the solar system. And if I wanted to um, add something here, I can say, let's add something to the word sun. So when it says the word sun, um, it actually thinks I meant person as a sun instead of like the bright sun. Uh, but I can actually change what it's selected um, here in my clip art selector. Uh, there's a way you can search for it. Um, I'm not seeing my search box right here. Um, oh, illustrations. That's why I need to go into the illustrations. And notice when I choose illustrations, I can say I want this picture of the sun to pop up at this point in my video. So you can add or remove icons at any point in the video. You can't do a lot in regards of animating them, but you could take some, that, something like this and you can put it into a different video editing tool. But it's just a fast, easy way to generate a reasonably complex video um, that if you were to do this by hand in a tool like Doodly would take 
at least a couple hours, even something this simple takes a long time to do. You can upload your own voiceover for this as well. You don't have to do text uh, based input. Uh, when you do text based input, it will have a robotic voice reading it. I'm not sharing my audio, so you're not going to see the text. But as I'm sharing the video, um, you'll be able to see what it would look like. So again, it's going to just read the, the video to me. And it's reading it right now and it said today we're going on a remarkable journey. And so you can see it's pulling in these different animations as those keywords are said, and then it wipes off the screen and goes to the next scene. So again, all I did is I put a single prompt in here to say, build me a video for that. And it quickly and easily built me an animated video that I can at least um, I can use, or I can have my students build these same things, have them write the script, have them put it into simple show. Simple show has a really generous educator uh, pricing model. So I do recommend uh, take a look at it if it seems interesting to you. Some other tools you might want to be uh, checking out are there's another one called Gamma. And let's say that um, it's gamma.app. This allows you to create uh, interactive slide decks, kind of like PowerPoints. It's a different format. Um, this uses a token based system. So I have 300 credits to start to generate a whole new slideshow cost me 40 credits to edit a slideshow cost like 10 credits. Um, and what it will allow you to do is put it again, put in a prompt and it will create an interactive slide deck with videos or images broken down uh, really nice. So I'm going to start with a new blank deck. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to say, make me a slideshow. Oh, I, I meant to do a rope. Uh, AI deck, new with AI. Um, and again, you can just put your own text in here if you want, or you can ask it to generate the text for you. So my presentation is going to be a uh, presentation for fifth grade students on the parts oops, of a rocket and how they work. And so it's just going to just generate uh, a slide deck based on my prompt and it's going to outline this. It's going to be different than what ChatGPT gave me because it's a different model. This is the outline introduction. What's a rocket, a brief history, parts of a rocket, each of the different parts, how it works. Um, if I like that, I can say continue. And then it's going to ask me to choose a theme. Again, I'll choose continue. And it's basically breaking down those bullet points and outline in trying to identify what's the best layout to use here. It might generate some tables. It might generate a timeline. It might do an image with some text. Uh, you can edit these after the fact in the Gamma tool, but they are different than a slide deck. Unfortunately, you can't just export this to PowerPoint, but you can see um, it's actually typing out the slides as we go along. It's finding appropriate images. So on the front page, it's showing a, a large image of a rocket taking up almost half the image. It has a really nice uh, uh, H1 text as well as a body text. These fonts are designed to work together. It's included appropriate emoji uh, into the system. And one cool thing about this tool is if you build it for your students, you can create different interactive experiences here. So you can link to other websites or have other embedded websites in this tool um, that you can't do as easily in like a PowerPoint. But really quickly, our history of rockets, it's showing me um, three column layout with an image, early rockets, modern rockets, and going to the moon. Uh, if I wanted to edit this, I can just click on this slide. And um, where's my AI assistant? Edit with AI. Uh, make this card a timeline. And it's going to use a few more of my credits to convert just this card into a timeline format instead of a three column layout. So I can see the different parts of my rocket, the nose cone, what matters is the shape, the material and the payload and has a brief description of each of those. So again, in much less time than it would take me to put this together, it does a pretty good job of having an interesting graphically rich slide deck. Um, there's another one called tome.app that you can also use that does a similar thing. Uh, here's my timeline now. Um, it chose the same information. It didn't actually put dates here. I probably should have been more descriptive. I should have said, show me a timeline with dates of the main stages of rockets with a picture of each rocket. Um, so that's an example of where I wasn't specific enough. But I am hoping you're getting from today is you can use these tools to make pretty good stuff really, really quickly with minimal effort. 
if you know what you're asking for. Uh, Dave, do we have another question? We have a couple more here. Douglas Carmichael is asking, is there any way to export formatted text from ChatGPT, Bard, and the others? Uh, for ChatGPT, yes, it's a, a feature that's in beta. Um, and I don't know when it decides to allow you to do it or not. I've seen since I subscribed yesterday, um, I can now click one button and it will copy and paste or even give a link to this conversation uh, for other people to view my exact conversation with ChatGPT. So that'll all be in our education discord. Um, for those of you who haven't joined it yet, you can sign up through our daily email. Next question. It's from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. Does it make sense to send all teachers to retreats where they're taught how to be experts at using artificial intelligence tools? Couldn't that alone more than double classroom effectiveness? Dr. Clark? I think uh, I would change one word in your question. Um, instead of sending all teachers, I'd say inviting all teachers to retreats. and. Uh, or professional development activities. And one of the uh, ideas we've developed on um, office hours with the leadership of Alex Lindsay is an approach that says, don't, don't try to force all teachers to go off to a, a two week retreat and, and uh, come back converted, but um, invite the early adopters and have them and don't set the bar at turning them into experts in a week or a day but um to demystify the goal would be to demystify uh some of these ai tools by um having scaffold and, and supportive help like john snyder has demonstrated today to um break through the uh the curiosity, initial reluctance, perhaps to learn one more thing, um, and and then return these these teachers return to their classrooms and they uh, learn how to uh, adapt and customize the tools that they've learned about in a kind of a general way at a professional development workshop to the particular needs that they have in their classroom with their subject matter, their students and so forth. And then as they become the, the only way to become more expert is to use these tools over and over again in the, in the setting where you already have uh, mastery of the context and you, you know what you need and you know what you don't need and you uh, repetitively um use the tools and of course come up with questions that perhaps can be answered by um a spin-off of office hours that john preto could operate between midnight and 1 a.m uh, las vegas time and uh, he'd answer all your questions and show up and and encourage the early adopters who then would have the attention of the next level of uh adventuresomeness among their colleagues and so forth. So that's, it's a, it's a more gradualist approach rather than a vaccinate them all in one day and, and uh, everybody's an expert. Those approaches uh, haven't worked in the past. Couldn't agree more. What's our next question, Dave? It's from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. How might a good lesson plan, a peer reviewed or textbook, be turned into a great hyperlink document or website that might flip the classroom? Is this a job for AI? I think your biggest challenge is that all of our current language models, not all of them, but the, the popular ones, all have limits on the input. So you can only certain put in a certain number of tokens, or you can think of them as the words you're inputting. Um, so you'd have to break it down to a small section by section format, but you could do that. You could do that and you can even do it with ChatGPT and ask it to build it and code it into HTML if you wanted to, if you knew what you wanted, or you could ask ChatGPT to give you ideas on what to do, or you could put it into something like a gamma that would guess some of that for you. I would just take a lot of iterations and I don't know um, to get exactly what you want. You probably still need that human touch. That's human editor, if nothing else. And next question. 
It's from Catherine Harrop in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She's putting together a list of the best veracity checking software to help journalism students who gather text from all platforms. Any suggestions for that software? Well, that's a really great question. Um, I don't know of a tool specifically to help um, check veracity. What I do know is all of these AI tools, because like I, we were talking about in the first hour, they, they work with statistical analysis and likelihoods, they all elucidate. They all make stuff up occasionally. They've gotten better and they'll continue to get better. With some clever prompting, you can limit hallucinations. Um, for example, you can ask to identify specific peer-reviewed um, journals that have a certain number of citations in ChatGPT, which is a really great prompt for the research side of things. I don't know of a specific tool to check the veracity of a source, though. Um, some other tools that you might want to, uh, your, your journalism, journalism students might like, one's called the Hemingway app. And you can actually put your text in there, your writing in there, and it will tell you the reading level of your writing. It will highlight any overly complex sentences or any adverbs and make suggestions on how to improve it. That's our next question. It's from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Are we defeating the power of AI when we ask it to target a specific grade level rather than both those above and below that grade level? Dr. Clark? Uh, Roscoe, we may be underutilizing the potential of um, AI if we if we stick with the the egg crate uh, division of students by age level into grades and so forth. Um, but we that that's going to happen anyway um, with any tool or any approach that we take. To planning, if we if we plan for greater diversity of ability um, and possibility among our students, then then uh, AI can help us think about a wider distribution of ability, interest, and and background knowledge, and also uh, accessibility issues come up here as well. So I think um, we <laughs> we can use the tool for a very narrow kind of perpetuation of what the way things have always been, or we can get help uh, thinking more broadly about who our students are and what they're capable of um, beyond uh, what we thought they were capable of last year. Thanks, Dr. Clark. And I personally am really excited by the um, ability to do intergenerational educational materials where you have the same material targeted at different audiences. So you come through with your lesson plan, you say, now write it for 30 year olds, now write it for 12 year olds. Um, and that will enable us, especially those in nonprofit organizations, if you have a theme, um, like in a house of worship or something, you can target the same theme across multiple generations with a lot less effort and keep your organization aligned. That's all we have time for today. I do want to point out a couple other tools I would recommend. Um, first is a, an image generation tool called Night Cafe. And with Night Cafe, it will actually let you use different models. So you can use the Dolly model or the Mid Journey model, or not Mid Journey. Um, it allows Dolly or um, Stable Diffusion, and you can choose different models and it has some different suggested promptings. It also uses credit based systems and it costs five credits to generate an image. You can get five free credits each day. That's a really interesting one if you want to see how the different models generate images. Bing's image generator is free, um, and that uses the Dolly 2 model. It's not quite as good as MidJourney. It's a lot easier to log into and use than MidJourney, in my opinion. So that's one you might check out. On the audio side, there's one called Ava, which allows you to create music beds. So if you had that YouTube video and you wanted to add some background music, you can generate your own background music using Ava. And you can suggest the key or the tempo or the music styles you want to mesh together. You can create your own music styles and merge them together. It's a really fascinating tool that devote, that deserves its own second hour by itself. Uh, we are out of time today, but we appreciate everyone and your contributions. As always, uh, thank you, Backend Crew, for another great show. It takes a tremendous effort to keep the show ship moving forward, and we couldn't do it without you, especially those of you who are rejoining us later for Cinegear coverage. Panelists, thanks so much for sharing your insights into how we can best use these tools and how we can uh, keep the human human and use AI to help augment the human instead of just replace it. It's great to learn together on these Saturday mornings. Producers, thank you so much for your insightful questions that drive the show. 
If you're watching the show and you're interested in learning more about Office Hours, make sure to sign up via our daily email where you can get our schedule, uh, links to our Discord, where a lot of this information will be posted after the fact. Um, you'll also be able to sign up to volunteer for the show if you're interested. If you were to travel from question to question today to ask each of our producers their questions, you would have traveled 47,000, uh, I've missed 718 miles. And that's about 76, that's exactly 76,794 kilometers or equivalent to 377 million bananas stacked end to end. Um, to give you an idea, that's enough bananas to fill a shipping boat. I think it's 345 million bananas if I remember correctly. Uh, thank you all for staying with us. We encourage you to stay through the credits to see all the contributors to our show. And remember that Cinecure coverage starts at 11 a.m. Pacific in two hours. Thanks for sticking around, Ronnie. That was helpful. Yeah. I truly hope I got that Finnish name well, uh, just right. I could yeah. not have done a better job. And I really, I really like the rocket, the uh, rocket thing. More rockets. The rocket launcher. We'll see you all later. <laughs>